Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us today to discuss how financial institutions and fintechs are partnering for inclusion. We have a really, really fun webinar for you today. We will hear the results of this research, which if you want to get a preview, you can look in the handout section of your GoToWebinar platform there. Um, but more importantly, we'll have a discussion uh, for the majority of this webinar about what this research means for financial institutions for, and, and their fintech partners. My name is Sonia Kelly. I'm director of research at the Center for Financial Inclusion. Um, and we're gonna get started in just a couple minutes, we'll give a little bit of time for, for people to join. So while we wait for them, uh, while we wait for people before we get started, why don't we put up a poll here on the screen to better understand who we're talking with today. So this first poll asks, which of these categories best describes you? What kind of, um, what kind of institution are you based in? Are you government and public sector? Are you private sector? Are you a development organization? Are you academia or a think tank or something else? Feel free to make that selection. Looks like many of you have made the choice. That's great. I'll, I'll leave it open for just five more seconds. And then we're going to close the poll and put up the results here. So let's see who we're talking with today. Looks like we have a lot of people from the private sector. 46% of you listening today are from the private sector. That's great. 25% from development organizations. And then government and public sector, academia and think tank and other are, are lower. Um, so this is really helpful for us as we tailor our conversation to you today so that we can um, be as productive as possible with our, with our time together. Let's go ahead and put up one more poll asking about where the focus of your research is or, or your work. Um, what region is the primary focus of your work? So select one of these options. There's Asia and the Pacific, Europe and Central Asia, Latin America and the Caribbean, the Middle East and North Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Go ahead and make that selection. Looks like a lot of you are, are answering this poll here. We have pretty good participation. I'll leave it open for just five more seconds. Go ahead and make that selection. All right, let's close the poll and see who we're who we're talking with today. It looks like actually the majority of people are based in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's really exciting. 24% um, in Latin America and the Caribbean, 14% um, in Europe and Central Asia, and 14% in Asia and the Pacific. And I should, sorry, I, I said um, nearly half of you based in Sub-Saharan Africa, but <laughs> to be very clear, the poll asks which region is the primary focus of your work. So you, you, know, you can be based anywhere, but still be focused on Sub-Saharan Africa. Again, this is really, um, Really interesting for us and helpful for us as we think about focusing our discussion uh, on the right things. So we'll go ahead and close that poll. And before we get into the content, let me just go through a few housekeeping items. First, I wanna show you how to actively participate. And we do want this to be an active discussion. We're going to, um, we're gonna open up the line to people who are listening. Um, and if you want us to open the line to you, or if you want us to answer a question that you might have any time during this webinar, feel free to um, do one of two things. You can either raise your hand, and that's that little hand icon that's in the GoToWebinar control panel, or you can type your question out in the questions drop-down menu, um, and we'll be sure to, to have a, start a conversation with you and ask you if you're in a place where you can um, be heard uh, if there's not a lot of background noise or um, or whether you would prefer your question to be answered um, by us just reading it, which is also fine as well. So, uh, so you can go ahead and use that function. Of course, you can also use those functions to reach out to us if you have any problems with your, um, your webinar platform and we're happy to help you address those. Um, I should mention that this week is uh, Financial Inclusion Week, which is really exciting for us at the Center for Financial Inclusion. We've had 60 partners in 22 countries having conversations on financial inclusion. Um, and this webinar, it comes at the end of Financial Inclusion Week. Um, without further ado, let me go ahead and turn it over to Dennis Ferenzi who is at the Institute of International Finance to talk a little bit more about the context of our conversation um, and also the Institute of International Finance's perspective on this topic. Dennis? Great, thank you so much, Sonia. 
As Sonia mentioned, my name is Dennis Ferenzi, and on behalf of the IAF, I'd like to thank everybody for joining today's webinar. The IAF includes 500 members from more than 70 countries representing every type of financial institution, including global and regional banks, insurance companies, hedge funds, asset management firms, insurance uh, payment providers, and new challenger institutions. We launched our financial inclusion work in 2013, and we've been grateful to partner with the thought leader in the space, CFI, for much of that time on projects to better understand the role of financial institutions in expanding financial services to unserved and underserved populations. In our view, we will not close remaining financial inclusion gaps without active engagement of traditional banks, insurers, and payment providers so we want to understand how changes in regulation, new business models, and especially new technologies will impact the ability of financial institutions to reach new or underserved customers. In this context, the IIS and CFI announced in January a two-year initiative titled Mainstreaming Financial Inclusion Best Practices to provide research, best practices, and expert insights on approaches to financial inclusion. MetLife Foundation is supporting the initiative with the grant and the International Finance Corporation is serving as a technical partner. The project will feature six separate deep dive reports. The first, which we will discuss here today, focuses on how partnerships between traditional financial institutions and fintechs are addressing financial inclusion challenges and expanding access to the formal financial economy for underserved segments of the global population. Our next report, which we will roll out in a couple of weeks, will explore insurance inclusion in emerging markets. Uh, at the beginning of 2018, we will put out reports on financial capability and a report on how new data tools are enabling firms to better serve low-income populations. We hope at the end of this two-year project to have a better understanding of what is working and what isn't working, and to have started a conversation with policymakers about what they can do to support successful efforts. At the IAF, we know that financial inclusion is the right thing to do, not only for customers served, but also for their economies. It allows poor households to expand consumption, absorb disruptive shocks, manage risks, and invest in goods, healthcare, and education. Countries will compete in part based on their ability to ensure that the financial sector serves their broader population. And at the IAF, we never lose sight of the fact that in addition to being the right thing to do in smart economics, financial inclusion is also good business. It will enable our members to expand their customer base and grow. Indeed, many of our members have made financial inclusion an important piece of their strategic plans and are harnessing new technologies and leveraging partnerships to create sustainable programs to reach consumers at the base of the economic pyramid. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Elise McGrath, an analyst at CFI and one of the co-authors of the report to present the high-level findings of the paper. Elise? Thanks, Dennis. Um, IIF has been a wonderful partner to work with, and we've also been very grateful to the financial support from the MetLife Foundation. Um, so thank you, Sonia and Dennis, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, as Dennis said, I'm Elise McGrath, a research analyst at the Center for Financial Inclusion, and I'm excited to give some context for our panel discussion later by sharing some of the high-level findings from our report. While I'm presenting, please feel free to begin sending in any questions that may come to mind and we will get to them following the panel discussion. Our methodology for this report was simple. Find successful partnerships between mainstream financial institutions and fintechs for financial inclusion and figure out what makes them tick, what common challenges they faced, what strengths they build on. As we searched through 24 interviews with people on the front lines, we found many of these partnerships, which runs counter to the narrative we saw just a few years ago when people were calling fintechs and financial institution enemies. We highlight 14 of these throughout the report, and I'll highlight a few of these during this presentation. 
Here on this slide, you'll see the full map of the partnerships we look at, and you'll notice that they cross borders, time zones, and language barriers. In other words, instead of going to their next door neighbors, financial institutions are canvassing the globe to find partners. I would like to note that our research shouldn't be seen as representative, but rather as aspirational, since we have had the fortunate job of telling the success stories in this report rather than documenting potential failures. Um, okay. Both fintechs and financial institutions have strengths, and together, and together they can be a potent cocktail for disruption. We'll talk a little later about some of the ingredients of this success, but at their best, these partnerships are a win-win-win for financial institutions, fintechs, and for underserved customers. On one hand, we found mainstream financial institutions partnering with fintechs to improve product offerings, increase efficiency, and lower costs. On the other hand, fintechs are partnering with financial institutions to scale their technology and to access capital to grow. That said, mainstream financial institutions are not willing to partner on just anything. There are core systems and processes that they see as sacred that they want to full control over either through acquisition or internal development. You'll see here representatives from Ujivan and BBVA echoing this sentiment. We often heard from banks, we are not a technology company. They are aware of their strengths and are looking to outsource some of their weaknesses. What we found is that partnerships are uniquely suited to help mainstream banks, insurance companies, and payment companies overcome significant financial inclusion challenges and learn a great deal along the way. The four things on this screen are the primary challenges that we found financial institutions seeking to overcome through partnerships. Gaining access to new market segments, creating new offerings for existing customers, data collection, use, and management, and deepening customer engagement and product usage. I'd like to share an example of what each of these looks like in practice. In Mexico, BBVA is partnering with Chilean-based fintech Destacame to provide credit to customers who have been denied through traditional screening. This is a good example of a financial institution addressing our first challenge with partnership, gaining access to new markets. Destacame provides an alternative credit scoring platform which builds a credit score based on a customer's bill payment history. This has allowed BBVA Bancomer to expand credit to thin file customers, especially those making less than $100 per month. In India, ICICI partnered with Silicon Valley-based blockchain company Stellar to create a mobile wallet for their customers. This partnership falls under our second financial inclusion challenge, creating new offerings for existing customers. Through the partnership, customers in India and living abroad can transfer money through the free mobile wallet. The value add for ICICI's customers enables the expansion of their product offerings and even lets customers transfer money easily to other people who have mobile wallets on the Stellar network. I don't need to remind this crowd that the volume of data available to help institutions make decisions continues to grow. Our third financial inclusion challenge is data collection use and management and I will highlight a partnership between Demis Data and a major bank in the Philippines. Demis leverages data to help the institution make better decisions about its customers and also provides a service in which they take and clean up data for easier analysis. And I'm excited to say that we have Lawrence from Demis Data on the line today, and so we'll get to hear a little bit more about that partnership and the work that Demis is doing on this specific financial inclusion challenge. Finally, I'll highlight that BBVA Bancomer and Bank Colombia are both partnering with Juntos, a Silicon Valley-based startup which provides automated SMS conversations enabled by artificial intelligence. This partnership addresses our first, fourth and final financial inclusion challenge of deepening customer engagement and product usage. Juntos sends tailored text messages to customers, reminding and nudging them to save and become active users of bank services. No matter what challenge they were addressing, all of the financial institutions we talked to were intentional about organizing for innovation. We found that if financial institutions have the right people in place with the right budgets, the partnerships are much more easily sourced. But we found a number of different models of sourcing and managing these partnerships. There were some that came out of an ad hoc interest. For example, the banking executive we talked to 
at ICICI had just finished reading a book about blockchain in his spare time that mentioned Stellar, so he called him up. On the other hand, Societe Generale, who we talked with, went through a more traditional RFP process, considered multiple fintechs, and ended up choosing TagPay for the mobile wallet they ultimately created. What these have in common is an internal champion. It's not how the partner is found, but who found them. And once they were found, all of the institutions we talked with wanted to make the process of moving from idea to partnership much easier. Some institutions created sandboxes, insulating a partnership process from bureau the bureaucracy, including risk, compliance, and even the board. And in another instance, ING requires that every fintech partnership have a sponsor at the top two levels of the institution. I should contextualize these operations by saying that the process of partnerships is, an uneven, is uneven, with just a few people on the fintech side and an enormous number of people and roles on the financial institution side. If you say that the partnership will take three months, fintech is shocked. <laughs> And on the other hand, the financial institution is shocked for very different reasons. It takes a lot of resources to partner, partner, but partnerships are very valued, even when they're not guaranteed. When we asked institutions about working together, they nearly all laughed and said that it was twice as hard and twice as long as they expected it to be. Here are two examples of timelines to partnerships that we saw. One on the EFL Global Partnership and one for the MetLife Imaginate Partnership. They take different lengths of time to be solidified and these examples are wildly different. Some of those techniques for organizing for innovation seem to explain some variation in our sample, but we also saw the kind of product the partnership is driving contributing to the length of time it takes to partner. For example, the partnership shown here between Santander and EFL required a year-long pilot in order to account for a full loan cycle, while the MetLife and Imaginate partnership is more on the customer and service side and required a much shorter pilot period. Overall, we heard anecdotal observations from financial institutions and fintechs that the process of partnering is getting easier. Fintechs are learning who to go to for what, having the tools and approvals they need on hand, and financial institutions are finding that they're able to learn from and adapt to new partnership opportunities. We tried to ask about the future of these partnerships that we looked at and obviously did not get solid answers. Most often we heard, we'll continue the partnership as long as it's working. We did hear the financial institutions, regardless of where the partnership goes, want to ensure stability, longevity, and create incentives for the institution. Here are a few examples of how institutions are doing that. Carlos Lopez Moctezuma of BBVA said that when he negotiates terms for a partnership, he always tries to err on the side of generosity, recognizing that he wants the financial institution to continue to be around. MasterCard Labs said that they have a fintech now negotiating with a financial institution that is offering a warrant to the financial institution to buy part of the company in a few years. That incentivizes both partners to work together to grow the fintech. And finally, AXA took a nearly 50% stake in MicroInsure. And I'll say we nearly did not include them in the report because we looked at them as an investment rather than a partnership. But after speaking with them, we came to understand that investment is the partnership stability strategy in that specific partnership. There are some predictions that the new threat to the traditional banking sector are the institutions that have brand recognition. Apple, Facebook, WeChat, Alipay. Fintechs help financial institutions to secure emerging customers, and that is the approach that financial institutions are taking. Financial inclusion is not seen as corporate social responsibility, but rather is seen as an integral part of the business. Fintechs help them to get there. And I'll end this part of the presentation by sharing an African proverb that Nina Niwal, who is one of our panelists today, shared during her interview with us. She said, if you want to go faster, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think that kind of summarizes what we heard throughout the interviews and our research in this report. And now I will hand it over to Sonia to begin our panel discussion. Thank you so much, Elise. And I hope that you will all bear with us. We're gonna to try to turn on our videos here. Great, I hope you can see me. And um, John Esri, Nina Niwal, and Laurence 
Chalude um, are all joining us from different different parts of the US. Um, all of them are either a, a financial institution or a FinTech, and we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about that during our panel discussion. Um, let me go ahead and just start our discussion by asking each person a question. And before you answer that question, feel free to give a little bit of an introduction um, to yourself and your organization. So John, why don't I go ahead and start with you since you are um, first on my screen here. John, one of the problems that partnerships solve is a lack of data on low-income customers. Um, I know that you're in the business of basically making data appear as if from nowhere. And can you tell us a little bit more about the identity score that you generate and describe how it changes the financial inclusion landscape? Sure. Um, first of all, for those that are not uh, familiar with Juvo, uh, we enable people to establish financial identities through basic credit um, services and gain access to these financial services via their everyday interactions with their, their mobile phones. And when we talk about identity scoring and what we're able to do, because these everyday interactions are going on uh, all the time, we engage with, you know, in our earliest uh, deployments, 50% of the subscriber base um, of a mobile operator, three, four, five times a month, we're able to generate a lot of our own data about usage patterns and those types of things. And rather than taking third-party data, um, which we do as well, we're able to use the, uh, the engagement uh, of that user on our services. And basically, what I would call feed the monster, um, where as they engage more, they learn, we learn more about them and can segment them uh, better and to uh, deliver the right service at the right time to them. That's really helpful. And, and John, I, I love hearing about the work that you and Juva are doing together. Um, Nina, I'll turn to you now. Um, Nina Newall is from MasterCard. And, and Nina, a challenge that we heard about as we conducted our research is that many prospective partnerships fail even before they get started. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you're able to ensure success as partnerships move from idea to implementation? Sure. Thank you for having me on the panel. I think a lot of things go around partnerships having clear guidelines on who is bringing what to the partnership and what everybody wants to achieve. I think if you look at it that way, everybody brings something unique, but there has to be somebody in between that almost plays the glue and make sure that everybody stays true to their commitment and stays on track to deliver. I think one of the frustrations in partnerships is often when one person doesn't bring to the party what they were expected to, and it starts causing internal frustration within the relationship, irrespective of what the end goal is or what could possibly be, have been achieved if everybody committed and kept to their commitments. MasterCard is a global company, obviously, our network is amazing. So we have various partnerships. We look at it from a very different way. There's beyond fintechs, we're also doing a lot of work with the aid organizations. And all of those partnerships are unique and all of them need to be approached uniquely. There's no such thing as a cookie cutter to saying that worked when we put that partnership together, therefore we can repeat it. Everyone needs to be adjusted, not only from who the partners are, but also for what is the problem that is being trying to be solved or addressed. Thanks, and let's turn now to Laurence from Dimes Data. Um, Laurence, partnerships don't last forever in the same way that they are conceptualized. And can you talk a little bit from your perspective with a FinTech about the way that you add value as partnerships continue and evolve? Yes, thank you so much, Sonia, for, for having us today. Um, so Dimes Data, in a nutshell, um, is a, a software provider that helps financial institutions um, harness the explosive growth of data that is out there for them to serve more customers and make better customer decisions. And, you know, since we focus specifically on facilitating data as access at scale for financial institutions, it's never an issue that is going to be solved 100% once and for all. Um, the data eco ecosystem is constantly evolving, and so we add value by continuously guiding um, our customers in this area. As you've mentioned earlier in your presentation, everyone knows that there is an immense amount of data that, that is out there, but financial institutions, despite this availability, still very much struggle uh, tapping into this variety of information and applying that information to better assess potential customers. 
And they're always going to need to test new data for a variety of use cases, be it to reduce fraud or, or make better um, customer decisions for credit purposes. Um, they're also going to always need to integrate new data that is structured in different ways and needs to be cleaned and standardized. So being able to um, be a, a partner in this data exploration and integration is a, is a valuable asset. Great. Well, for me as a researcher working on this report, my very favorite part of the interview process was asking um, our interviewees about very specific partnerships that they had. So I'd love to ask each one of you to share a specific partnership that you have, um, you know, who the partner was, what it sought to accomplish, and then what some of the um, impacts have been, whether early or, or whether the partnerships have been going on for a while, and impacts have been for financial inclusion. Nina, why don't I, why don't I start with you? Sure. I mean, Sonia, my favorite partnership would have to be the Net One Grinrod partnership, which we did in South Africa. And the impact was just amazing. If you think about it, we had Net One, who's a fintech. We had Grinrod, which by all means and standards was a really small bank. And they were faced with this mammoth task of saying there's 17 million people who receive social grants in South Africa. And how do we take that and turn it around from being done in cash and checks to doing it digitally and using a debit MasterCard? Um, we combined Net One's technology with biometrics onto a single debit card. So we had a single chip with dual functionality. But ultimately, I think where the big surprise came on, having a small bank, how do you reach 17 million people in a really short period of time? And we basically went to remote areas using suitcases. Um, we used churches, town halls, parks anything, tents, where people could come in and they could register and they could get their card, they would have a bank account open, they would have their biometrics taken, and they would basically do all of this in under 10 minutes and leave with the card, which was operational with the pin that they had chosen. At the heat of the project, we were basically reaching 150,000 people a day. And overall, what that impact did for South Africa as a company was, we went from financial inclusion at about a 55% rate all the way up to a 77% rate in just under two years. So that was the, the impact from a financial inclusion perspective, but there's a lot of other stats which really speak positively about it. So if you think about um, internally in MasterCard, we often use that all tides must rise when we are doing things. And this is one of those programs. So if I start at the top of the pyramid and I go, what did it mean for government? I need to speak about the cost savings that it brought to them. So by moving away from cash and checks, which was costing them about $3.66 per disbursement, going digitally, that dropped all the way down to about $1.60. It also allowed for them to do multiple grant disbursements onto a single card. So for an example, if I was an old age pensioner receiving my old age grant, but I also took care of three of my grandchildren and they were receiving child support grants in the previous system, if it was cash and checks, government would have been paying $3.66 by four or times four. If you looked at the new system with the card, they were only paying the, the $1.60 once. And due to that, the price coming down and the multiple grants being paid onto a single card, we managed to save government in the region of about $375 million over a five-year period. So that was the one saving. Um, because the card had biometric functionality, we were also able to eradicate about 850,000 illegal grant collectors. And that goes anything from where people had registered children multiple times, or where we had people who had registered themselves multiple times and they were collecting multiple grants, or people that had passed away and families still continue to collect their grants, which is another huge saving of about $350 million. So when you look at it that from a taxpayer's perspective, from a government perspective, those are massive savings by just changing the way. Um, and then if we look at the actual grant recipients, what did it mean to them? There's a lot of really heartwarming stories when you meet with them and you say to them, what does your card mean to you? And you hear people giving responses like, I feel as if I belong. I feel as if I'm somebody. You know you've done the right thing. You also know you've done the right thing when people go, I feel safe for carrying my card and going shopping versus when I was carrying huge amounts of cash and everybody knew I had cash when I was leaving the, the cash points at the end of or the beginning of each month. So I think all of that really made a huge difference. The way in which the program was rolled out and everybody had a very, very key and important part to play with it. It was also great to hear about from a government perspective where they often spoke about being involved with a company like MasterCard and Net One, where they could get immediate data gave them things like instant intelligence. So they knew where people were using their cards. They were also able to make decisions based on that. 
So really early on in the program, we realized people were going across to some of the, the bordering countries and using their cards there. So we were able to pull back and saying, these cards are only going to be used for domestic use. It's government funds. Those funds should be used within the country. So that would have to be one of my favorite partnerships of just how well things can work when things get tweaked, how all boats rise with the tide which comes up, um, and just by doing things differently, which had not been done previously. Wow, a lot of different, com not competing interests, but a lot of different interests at, on the table here with this partnership. And um, and it sounds like you, you really were able to, to meet a lot of those different interests, including the customer's interest in, in being recognized and feeling like they have an identity. I think that's, that's really special. Um, let me just remind everybody, we've had a few questions come in, and I just want to remind you, you can, um, you can press the little hand icon that's in your control panel, or you can um, submit a question in the, in the questions box there, um, and, and we'll be sure to get to them in our discussion. Let me turn to Laurence now. Um, Laurence, uh, can you give us an example of a very concrete partnership that DMIS Data has? Yeah, I think the, the partnership that we discuss in this report in this report is particularly relevant to this conversation. We worked with a, a global bank in the Philippines to help them uh, target and accept and file customers. Um, as you clearly explained at the beginning, um, a lot of people still don't have a credit history, which makes it very complicated for large financial institutions to service them um, and provide credit products and, and personal loans. And uh, this, this case study was a very good example of how by leveraging alternative types of data in a country that has a very new uh, credit bureau infrastructure with limited credit profiles, how by uh, leveraging alternative data, you could really boost the number of uh, thin file customers who would go from being rejected to becoming accepted customers. And we managed to show how nearly 50% of their monthly rejects could actually be accepted if they were to use different types of, of data, such as geolocation data, phone databases, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that was, that was a significant um, achievement and a significant example to show. The, the other part is also on the, on the business side, as Nina explained, you, you need to make this profitable for, for a company to make it worth their while. And so by also showing how they can reduce manual verifications and become more efficient in their verification process, um, how you can reduce manual verifications and increase automation, you can make this a lot more, um, a lot more appealing to them um, as a system and encourage them to seek out to a different types of customers. So that was also a significant achievement where we managed to automate their processes by nearly 70% so that they wouldn't have to make phone calls to verify employment status or, or send somebody physically to verify addresses and things like that. That's great. And that number of increasing um, acceptance rates by 50% is, is really amazing. Congratulations on that success. John, let me turn to you now and ask about a specific partnership example that you can give us from Juvo's experience. Yeah, I look at um, our partnership uh, with uh, cable and wireless. You know, the one thing we look at when it comes to financial inclusion is the very first step is financial access and getting enough people engaged and in, in, in using the system changes a lot of things. And in our partnership with Cable and Wireless, we made a, a very conscientious decision early on with Cable and Wireless that we we're gonna charge um, for their uh, telecom service uh, credit extensions, no, uh, no fees and no interest. And in doing so, we were able to engage you know, a large population of their subscriber base and learn about them so that we could create the data so that we could then layer on additional financial services. And in doing so, some you know, interesting things happened, and I'll go specifically to, um, they had some hurricanes uh, recently in the last few months that uh, devastated some of the, uh, the islands down there. And for those of you that don't live in hurricane areas, the first thing that happens when a hurricane comes is the ATMs run out of cash. And the, the next thing is all the stores close up. And when you're in a situation like that, you know, you want to uh, relay to your family that um, uh, you're safe um, as the hurricane is coming. 
during the hurricane and after the hurricane. And with cable and wireless, we were able to uh, you know, reach a large portion of their population and offer the, you know, the ability for the people that didn't have balances on their phone to continue to stay in touch with the people and their loved ones throughout the process. And through the data, we we're actually able to track the hurricane um, through the data and see exactly when it was hitting each island because we saw these huge spikes in usage um, of our services as people were preparing and living through those hurricanes. And it wasn't something that we were trying to do. It wasn't something that, you know, as I said, was no interest, no fees. We weren't trying to take advantage of the situation. And it really felt good that, you know, cable and wireless, ourselves, and the subscribers that we were able to offer a service to them um, that was beneficial to them uh, at their time of need. And, um, you know, that was, you know, I think my, my, it tugs at my heartstrings that we were able to do that for them when people were at, you know, some really uh, tough times. Yeah, a very relevant example for today as well. Let's go ahead and open up the phone lines. I'd love to, um, to hear from Herard Kotzi who is joining us from CGAS, the consultative group to assist the poor. Herard, are you on? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Go ahead. Very good. Um, good morning, uh, Sonia and panel. I've got two um, uh, quick questions. The first question is, it seems to me that if I have to read a book and may, maybe find the right contact partner, and I may read the wrong book, uh, that's sort of hit and miss. Isn't there a better way to find uh, contact partners through using, for example, uh, open API marketplaces, things like that. Uh, so just observations about that. And then the, my second question is a hypothetical uh, 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 sort of consideration. I'm very worried about um, in these partnerships, what happens to the customer's data? Who protects the customer? Who we'll look after them? Say, say we have this, uh, uh, possibility of somebody taking that data uh, of a grant recipient and selling them payday loans afterwards. How do you protect the customer and your own reputation against that? Great questions. I'm going to bounce that question on finding partners to Nina. I'm sure there are definitely more strategic ways to find partners than reading a book on your holiday. Um, so Nina, I'll ask you that one. And then John and Laurence, whichever one of you after Nina speaks wants to address the question of who owns and protects the customer data, I'm sure that's something you deal with all the time when you talk with your partners. Sure. Thanks, Carol, for the question. I think there's always a, when you're looking for a partner, I think it just, it goes beyond just the functionality that they can bring to the partnership, but there also needs to be a meeting of minds and personalities. I think if you look through the report that was even published and you speak to multiple people and they go, why was a partnership working and suddenly it stopped working? You often find that somebody either stepped out of the partnership from a relationship perspective, or there was a change in roles. And suddenly people just didn't understand each other anymore. I often go, being a relationship manager is more being um, a translator in understanding where everybody's coming from and understanding one person raising their voice might not mean they're angry. It might be a cultural thing versus the next person, if they raise their voice, is a really serious thing. I know we say that in light and in just, but it all goes around about the cultures. Are there similar cultures within each company who's coming into the partnership? And often the partnerships, are, there's more than just two parties involved in it. And it's often two companies behind the people that are behind it as well. So, for example, if you think about it, if you've got different views on the laws of a specific country, it's never, ever going to work. If you've got different drivers for why you want the partnership to work and the one is in it purely for financial gain versus the other one being in it for more of a CSR initiative, you're also going to find challenges there. So I think it's there's various things that need to happen. What I do say about partnerships is often through networking, people can introduce you to like-minded people. I always go, you find people who view the world in the same way, often connect at the same type of events. They often understand what developments are being done by which parties. And when you're working in, in those circles of people, you're often able to get the connection to saying that would probably be an ideal partner for what you're trying to do versus trying to source them on your own. Yeah, the importance of, of like-mindedness and shared goals. I'd love to get Herard back on the line if you if you don't mind before we turn to his other question. Um, Herard, I, I know that you have experience with open APIs and 
um, and sourcing partners from your work with ABSA Bank in South Africa um, and wondered if you can talk a little bit more about what you saw there in terms of how, um, how partnerships are sourced from the financial institution's perspective. Just to put you on the spot, Harard, are you still with us? No, no, I'm with you. I'm, I'm listening. I, I think uh, what Nina is referring, uh, referring to is sort of partnerships more at a higher level uh, then what I'm referring to is how do you get sort of nice fintech innovations and how do you source them because you can't go uh, and find them one by one on your own. But I totally agree that uh, once you have that, even if you have an open API marketplace, you need to make sure that you have enough rules around that to make sure that you get like-minded people, that you get people who won't uh, sort of ruin each other's reputations, etc. And I, I, you know, Nina, we've, we've both worked for large institutions. There are so many compliance officers standing around you to look at the controls around this. And that's the kind of thing that, they, uh, that you built into the rules around that over and above what you are referring, which is a more sort of uh, empathetic, aesthetic sort of alignment, yep. if, you, if you want to call it that. Uh, our, our, our experience, not necessarily with APSA, but just what we saw with a couple of these cases is that um, it takes a long time before a very large institution gets to an open API marketplace. They go to fa through phases where they first work with partners they know, then they go to the next le level with sort of medium sized, and then they will open it up. So that's basically what we see at this stage. Yeah, it seems like it's an exciting time in this space with open APIs put forward by institutions themselves, but also mass APIs um, like FinConnecta in Latin America and FinForward in Sub-Saharan Africa and other, other innovations there. I, when we first presented this research um, to a smaller group of people, somebody raised their hand and said, I think we need a Tinder for partnerships, which I thought was a really funny, <laughs> funny expression. So let's turn to that other, that other question, who owns and protects the customer data? Like, how does that work? Um, and Laurence and, and John, I, I would love to hear your perspectives on this, working with a lot of data. Yeah, from our perspective, you know, to echo Nina's point is, you know, a partnership only works if, you know, you're both in it together. And hitting minimum, you know, data encryption requirements or, you know, security requirements isn't going to work. You know, you've got to go above and beyond um, protecting the, the core assets, whether it's the financial institutions or the mobile operators or you know, what have you, um, to make sure that they're comfortable. Uh, I can't tell you the number of lawyers and security scans and things that we go through on a weekly basis um, to make sure that's happening. Um, so you, you, you've got to bring it to the most advanced, the highest level, regardless of what country you're going into. In a lot of cases, the EU is leading the charge. Um, and that kind of, you know, sets the bar for uh, the rest of the world. And so, you know, we tend to uh, make sure that we're, we're above that bar um, from a data rights perspective, or I'm sorry, a data privacy perspective. From a data rights perspective, I think it's a much more complicated question um, because the user has rights to some of their own information. The financial institutions have, um, you know, rights to some of their information. Um, the the data that is created, you know, during the process is new data that, you know, has multiple parties that have rights to it. So we could spend an entire seminar on, on data rights and how, how best to do that. But needless to say, people need to be open-minded because you can't deliver um, the services without sharing that data and that information uh, to be able to deliver the right service to the right uh, person. So I, I kind of close with that comment. Yeah, adding on to um, what John um, just said, um, obviously data privacy is an issue that we deal with on a, on a daily basis. And because we work all over the globe, it's really interesting to see how different geographies deal differently when it comes to data privacy. So while the US is a lot more lenient when it comes to, to that issue, as John mentioned, the, Euro the, the European Union and, and Europe generally is a lot more strict. Um, there are key issues with regards to consent and sharing data across border um, and how that's more heavily regulated. Um, 
Similarly, in, in Asia, there are increasing regulations and an attempt at generating regional frameworks for when it comes to sharing customer data. So it really depends where you are operating um, in, 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 the, in the landscape of, of a given geography. But just like John mentioned, um, we believe that we should adhere to the strictest standards um, that are established by Europe and, uh, and follow those, uh, those higher guidelines. Um, and generally also, we very much advocate to, in, to create systems where the individual has a greater role and power and voice in how his or her data is being shared. Um, incentivizing systems where an individual's consent is being requested at the time of a product application where an individual is being asked do you agree that X data is being shared for you to access X product is, we believe, um, a system we should be striving for. So it sounds like in answer to the question, who, who has the responsibility of protecting customer data, your answer is kind of everyone <laughs> um, has that responsi responsibility, including, including the customer. Um, I'd love to, to stick with John and Laurence and ask for fintechs, like, what is the draw to a partnership model rather than moving forward alone um, or leveraging open APIs, you know, and, and not doing bespoke partnerships or pursuing licensing models or seeking acquisition? Like, what keeps you creating very specific partnerships with financial institutions or, in your case, done with, with telcos? Um. So Dennis Data actually started by working with um, smaller and niche lenders. And um, you know, you mentioned speed being a key issue at the at the beginning of this conversation. And even though when working with smaller and nimble um, organizations, you tend to move at a faster speed and the, the work is really interesting. We also quickly came to realize that in order to reach customers at scale, um, financial institutions had distinct advantages. Um, they're, they have acquired expertise in such a variety of areas all along the value chain and where fintechs can really add value and become competitive is by making them stronger at a specific function or a specific competence. And so for us, the draw is to make them better at data access, which is so crucial to reaching more customers. And, and the draw for us is to help continuously support and drive innovation within those large organizations whose offerings and services meet the needs um, of the world's financially underserved. We lost you, Sonia. I think you're on mute. Oh, I was on mute. <laughs> How about you, John? Um, why, don't you, why don't you go it alone? Why do you choose to pursue your work through partnerships? Sure. You know, in partnerships, and I think uh, um, Nina might have mentioned it, it's, you get a, um, both parties or multiple parties have to bring value to the table uh, to make a true partnership. If you've got a technology provider um, that's trying to leverage the, you know, the, you know, the MasterCard brand and the MasterCard customers and, you know, they're not bringing a whole lot to the table, it's an unbalanced relationship and I think it's, you know, it's going to be tough to succeed in the long term in that, in that scenario. So when we look at, you know, fintech um, or, you know, financial institutions that we're partnering with is, you know, we want to bring value to them. And, you know, we sat down and had um, discussions with banks around the world with, you know, working with MasterCard and um, some of the other uh, 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 card uh, providers. And what we bring to the table is we bring um, a large, you know, unbanked or underbanked subscriber base that's not part of their traditional banking network. And I'll use the Philippines uh, as an example. You've got, you know, I think it's 2,000 islands in the Philippines. It's just uneconomical for a traditional bank to, you know, create bank branches in, you know, each of those geographies to reach the people there. It's also, it doesn't scale in terms of the people, you know, reaching out there. So, you know, if you can capture those individuals in a, a way and identify them and bring them to a partnership, um, then, you know, for the likes of MasterCard, it becomes very interesting. And, and, and Nina, I don't know what your, uh, um, 
your target population is, but I've got to imagine it's the top, you know, one and a half to two billion people in the world. Um, and it's not because they don't want to reach the rest of them. It's because they don't necessarily have access or the information, which might be, you know, the credit score or, you know, some sort of scoring system to be able to segment those people. And so if you can bring, if a technology provider can bring, you know, those people and identifying information to the likes of MasterCard, then it's usually valuable. And to the people that bring that information to MasterCard, it's valuable to now leverage the MasterCard capabilities in the brand. So, you know, you, you can use that scenario across banks, you know, credit cards, um, you know, uh, insurance, microinsurance, AXA, and just, you know, keep, uh, keep going down the road on all the different financial products uh, that you can offer to these unbanked and underbanked people. Nina, same question, but different perspective. Why do you choose to work through partnerships rather than um, develop things internally? I mean, I think there's a lot of development that we do do internally, but even when we do develop internally, we often share that with our partners. Whether you want to see banks as our partners um, or program managers or other partners, we do share what we develop. It's never just for us to use solely. And in many cases, we can just go so much faster and so much further with regards to winning partnerships. Um, at the current rate, we're saying it'll probably take another 200 years before we financially include everybody. And that's just too long. And the only way we're ever going to do this and make a meaningful difference is through partnerships. And it's not a question, how can we speak about financial inclusion and inclusive growth, yet try and keep it exclusive to only a few to participate? That's never going to work. It's only through partnerships that everybody's going to benefit and that we're actually going to get to a state of inclusion, which brings everybody to a better place um, and gives us to a position where poverty might get something, be something of the past. So that's why we're doing it. Um, and it needs to be sustainable, which often brings up the whole CSR initiative. And that's not what it is. And for things to be sustainable, you need more than one person just driving it. Great. We've had another question come in here about the time it takes to partner. <laughs> um, and, and my understanding is that this has been improving over time to go from idea to full partnership. But um, can you talk, Nina, a little bit of, about um, about how you are addressing the the challenge of the time it takes to partner? Sure. I mean, I think it also depends on what type of partnership you're trying to build. And is it a question of when do you first meet? And I want to use the word suss each other out to know this is a real partnership. Or once you've agreed that you're going to be partners and how long does it take you then to deliver and actually make impact? I think those are two very different conversations. In many times, the partnership conversation takes months to actually get to a place where everybody's in agreement, but then you find it moves a lot quicker when it actually gets to implementation, especially if you're building something together um, and getting it into market. And in other cases where it might only be us and one other partner partnering, we have found that it has moved quicker and we can pilot fairly um, quickly. All of these things are very, very circumstantial. It depends on which market you're going to, what is the problem that you're trying to solve, what is the regulation within there, who are the partners, have they done this before, or are there two people in the partnership and we identify a third gap, and do we need to go out and find that other person? Um, finances often come into it. It's never cheap to roll out these programs. Who's funding what? How are they looking at it? Where's that money coming from? And is there agreement on how that return model looks over a longer period of time? So I would love to say there's this one-stop shop where it's two months and a partnership is done, but unfortunately that's not the reality. There's so many other softer factors which come into it before a good partnership is formed and before the fruits can bear. John, you're laughing over there. Can you, can you share a little bit more from your perspective about the time it takes to partner and the, and yeah. The resources. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'll rephrase what uh, Nina said is, you know, it's the number of people involved, it's the number of regulations you have to jump through. Um, yes, there's an upfront, uh, you know, comfort level with the people you're partnering with. Um, it's actually, it, it sounds crazy, but the easiest part is almost the deployment. Um, if you pick the market, pick the opportunity, pick the partners, um, and actually just, just build it and get it out there, it's all the upfront work. Um, that, that takes the time, and it's really dependent on how many parties are involved, what you know, geographies you're going into, what the regulations are involved, and those types of things. 
Great. Well, um, we have one more question that I'd like to open the line to. This is Chris. Um, Chris, just for a little bit of context, wants to ask a little bit more about um, questions that are uh, multilaterals, multiple parties involved. Christian, uh, Chris Sherwanka. Chris, are you there? Yes, thank you. Great. Yeah, my, thanks. My question is really a tack on. Uh, I was writing it just as the panel was speaking right now, and that was helpful. Um, but it had to do with, uh, you know, coming from a fine tech perspective, how to I inject and get, um, uh, join some of these multilateral partnerships when, uh, as you've talked about a little bit, they seem to often have many stakeholders and be kicking off initiatives that go for multiple years. So as a small fine tech trying to find when the genesis of the, those partnerships are happening and at what forum we can present ourselves uh, and our value proposition, is there is there best practice for, for doing that um, or some good ideas and Furthermore, if you hear about one of these multilateral partnerships, is there a way to get involved midstream, even if sort of funding and the, um, you know, the partnership or collaborative arrangement has been made uh, a bit further in advance? Thanks, Chris. Who'd like to take that? I'll, I'll start on, you know, I, I think to, to get something off the ground and I'd be interested in hearing the other panelists um, uh, how they answer this, but we always look at what's the minimum uh, viable product to get off the ground. Like everybody wants to do a lot of very interesting, very powerful things, but in order to get through the the multiple you know parties involved and the, the things I raised uh, as I answered the last question is what's the the basic level you know value proposition that you're trying to solve and get that you know, off the ground and in market before you start adding on the, all the bells and whistles. And that's how we attack it is, is making it simple, easy to use, and a clear value proposition to this, you know, the end user that you're trying to reach. If you can do all that, then, you know, a lot of the surrounding um, things are just a noise at the beginning and you try and block them out um, to, to get into market as quickly as possible. Um, and then Chris, I think, the other part of your question was getting involved midstream, and and my understanding from Nina's example is that um, you know it might be sometimes that there's a bilateral partnership um, that realizes that they need some other technical expertise or um, a, a missing piece of the puzzle, and the, and then a third party would be added. Is that accurate, Nina? Absolutely. I mean, we've seen that happening because projects evolve. They start off with one thing, and as they start doing pilots or testing, they realize there's something else which would either make it better um, or make the user experience so much better. And then they're going, instead of us trying to build, which would take time, let us rather go and find a partner who already has the capabilities and let's bring them in. So I've seen that happening. Chris, on a different note, um, MasterCard has an initiative called Start Path, which I recommend you look into. It's one of the initiatives that we've got where we introduce fintechs to other partners and we often find partners who come to our Pathfind or Start Path to find people who are startups and who have got the capabilities that they're looking for. So once you start Mixing and networking in those circles, you'll probably find a lot more opportunities will come to you in the earlier stages versus midway um, or never being quite sure which conversations are taking place that you've just not been involved in. That's great. We're nearly out of time, so I'd like to ask one final question as the, as the moderator prerogative. Um, rapid fire down the line, so very short answers. If you had $5 million to invest in a fintech startup or a certain kind of technology whose primary success model would be to partner with financial institutions, mm -hmm. where would you invest your funds? And John and Laurence, you cannot choose your own company. So <laughs> <laughs> let's start with Laurence. Laurence, where would you invest your funds? I think um, obviously us, but beyond that, I think, um, Technologies that advance cash economies, and not, I'm not just saying that because MasterCard is also on the panel <laughs> with Nina, but um, I think there's such a dramatic need to digitize a lot of this to create financial transactions that can then, or in like financial histories that can then translate into credit decisions. That would be my point. Nina? Um, I would definitely have to invest in open APIs and data security. 
that's where I would be going. Great, and John. Yeah, I, I'd say the data, um, data aggregation or data creation uh, type companies where you can uh, you, you can attack the subscriber base you're going after through you know, the company that has, has pulled the necessary information together. Wonderful. Well, if any of those things take off, everybody will know who to talk to about them. <laughs> Thank you so much, John, Nina, and Laurence. Thank you to IIF. Thank you to MetLife for funding this research, and um, thank you all of us who are joining us as part of Financial Inclusion Week. For more information, you can download the report from the handout section or visit our website where you can download the paper, read a short summary, or share the research. We put a, a shortened link there on the slide. It's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash partnering fintechs. Thanks, everybody, and looking forward to you joining us for our next webinar.